In this lecture, you'll be learning how to create a SQL Server RDS database within AWS. Amazon Web Services provides a free tier for you to utilize and get a feel of many of its services. So you have three types of offering available. You have the free trials, 12 months free, and the always free tier. If you scroll down and select 12 months free, then you'll see the list of resources that are available for 12 months. If you check always free, then you'll see a list of resources that are always free. So I'll be selecting 12 months free. Now under the RDS databases, under the free tier, under the RDS database free tier, you have 750 hours available for you to use. And this is for MySQL, Postgres, or your DB or SQL Server. If you look carefully, if you look carefully, there are a few restrictions in terms of what you can use when you're creating the database. So for example, you have a db.t2 micro db class, the db.t3 micro db class, and the db.t4 micro class. So when you're creating the SQL Server, if you want to utilize a free tier, you have to utilize one of these options. So I already have an account, so I'm going to sign in. Once you're signed in, your console home will be empty. However, we want to get to the RDS console page. So from the search option, you can search for RDS. Then select RDS. Select create database. Select Microsoft SQL Server. And then select easy create. This will allow you to select the free tier. However, for this course, I will not be utilizing the free tier because I want to complete the training using a higher version of SQL Server. With the free tier, you can't utilize the latest version of SQL Server. So I'm going to select Standard Create. For the database management type, it's Amazon RDS. For the SQL Server Edition, I'll be utilizing Standard. In upcoming modules, for the SQL Server Engine, I'm going to select the latest build. And for the template, I'm going to select Dev Test. The DB Instance Identifier is used to uniquely identify your database instance. So I'm going to give it a name. And for the credentials, I'm going to keep the default as admin. For the master password, you can specify your own password or select auto generate a password. For the DB instance class, I'm going to select the smallest one, which is DBM5. For the storage type, I'm going to go with the general purpose SSD. The allocated storage is the size that you want your database to be. I'm going to keep it the smallest, which is 20 gigabytes. I don't want to enable auto scaling, so I'm going to uncheck this. And for high availability and durability, I'm going to select no because I don't want to always on or mirroring enabled. For the virtual private cloud, I'll be keeping the default. And if you're creating an instance for the first time, these will be automatically created for you. I'm going to enable public access because I don't have a side-to-side -side VPN in place. For the VPC security group settings, for the VPC security group, I'm going to choose existing. In your case, a default one will be created for you. For the availability zone, I'm going to select US East dashed away. I am not going to enable Windows authentication because my Active Directory is not configured. For performance in sight, I'm going to turn off the performance in sight because I don't want to utilize my free 7 days as yet. Expand additional configuration. You will see the default parameter groups and the default option group. In upcoming lectures, you'll learn more about the parameter group and the option group. So by default, the backup retention period is 7 days and it goes up to a maximum of 35 days. So I don't want any automated backups just yet and I'm going to disable encryption for now. For log exports, you can choose to publish your logs to Amazon CloudWatch logs. Amazon CloudWatch is used for monitoring, which you'll learn more about later on in this course. For your maintenance window, you can keep the no preference or you can choose a window when you want your maintenance to take place. So I'm going to select no preference for now. And for deletion protection, the deletion protection will protect your database from being accidentally deleted. At the end of the page, you'll see an estimated cost the database instance will cost you for the month. However, if you selected the free tier, you should be seeing a total cost of zero. Once you are satisfied with your configuration, select create database. 
So the database creation is currently in progress. While your database is being created, it's important that you view your credentials if you did not enter it manually and then you save your credentials. The database is now available and we can select the database instance. On this page, you see an overview of the database. The database identifier, the CPU utilization, current connectivity, status, the engine that you are running, the database class and region. On the connectivity and security tab, you want to ensure that publicly accessible is set to yes. This is the endpoint that you'll be using to connect to the database and this is the port. So now it's time to connect to our RDS database. So what we are going to need to connect is the endpoint. So normally when you're connecting to SQL Server, you normally utilize a host name. However, RDS managed databases do not use a host name, but they use an endpoint. So from your RDS main dashboard, and if you don't know how to get to this dashboard or you don't remember, in the search box search for RDS, then select RDS, and then select database instances, and then you'll be seeing the databases that you created. However, if by some chance you're not seeing the databases because when I was just starting out, this has happened to me before. Because I was in a different region, I was not able to see my databases. So if I select US East, then I will not be seeing any RDS database instance. So let me select East Ohio. Select your database instance, right? And on the connectivity and security page, you will see your endpoint. So let's copy this and the port that your database is configured to run on. So from our programs, search for SMS, our SQL Server Management Studio, then select it. So for your server name, specify the endpoint and the authentication type is going to be SQL Server Authentication. And for the login, it's the admin and then specify your password. So I'm going to check remember password. When you're connecting to your server, if you wanted to connect to a specific database on your instance, right? Select option and then in the connect to database, you specify the database that you want to connect to. So I'm not going to specify any database. So I'm going to select login. Now let's select connect. So my connection should have went through already. So it seems like I'm going to get a connection timeout error. So let's wait a little bit more and see. So a network related or instance specific error occurred while establishing a connection to the SQL server. So more often than not, what happened in this case is that I need to allow my IP to access the database instance. So let's go back to the RDS console. So on the security and connectivity page, the first thing you want to ensure that you check is the publicly accessible. So it is selected yes, so we are good in this regards. Now the whole reason why we are using public is because we don't have a site-to-site -site VPN in place. However, as a database administrator, this is something that you don't have to worry too much about within your organization. So under security, select the security group. Select inbound rules. Scroll down. So here I have three inbound rules. So what I am going to do is select edit inbound rules. I'm going to add a new rule and the type is MSSQL. Once I select MSSQL, it will populate the port range. In the source section where you see custom, select the drop down and select my IP. Then select save rules. So now let's go back to management studio and try to connect to the database instance. So select connect and there we go. Within a few seconds, you should be able to connect to your RDS database instance. Now, I intentionally allow this because these are issues that will arise sometime and you have to troubleshoot your way to figure out what happened. So to test that everything is working fine, select new query and type select get date. Select get date is a simple function that returns the current date and time. So let's execute and the date is returned as the 28th of the second. 2023. In the next lecture, we're going to be taking a look at option groups.